Israel pummeled Gaza with airstrikes and fired artillery cannons over the border on Saturday. Palestinians staged anti-Israel protests as the worst conflicts in years continued for a sixth day. Fighting between Hamas and Israel showed no sign of stopping. Palestinians in Ramallah on the West Bank protested Israel on the anniversary of the Nakba when some 70,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled from their homes in the war that led to the founding of Israel back in 1948. Palestinian medics said at least 136 people have been killed in Gaza since hostilities erupted on Monday, including 34 children and 21 women with 950 others wounded. Israel has reported eight dead, including a soldier on the Gaza border and six civilians, two of them children. At the Gaza hospital, five-month-old baby Omar was the lone survivor from an Israeli airstrike early on Saturday that killed his mother and four of his siblings. Health officials said an Israeli airstrike targeted a three-story building in the beach refugee camp in Gaza City. It killed eight people, including a woman and her four children. Many others were wounded. Rescue efforts lasted for several hours to save some who were buried under the rubble of the house. Rescue workers were able to recover the infant who was thrown out of the house. Images of the boy went viral on social media. To unpack the humanitarian situation in Gaza that has been exacerbated by escalating conflict in Israel, we're now joined via Zoom by Gift of the Givers founder, Dr. Imtia Suleiman. Dr. Dr. Suleiman, a very good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to The Globe. Good evening to you, Simbibe. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure having you join us this evening, Doctor. Now, Gift of the Givers has made its way to Gaza already, and uh, just going through uh, this clip, I mean, it suffices to mention that the situation is absolutely deplorable, and you are now sending an SOS for help. So what's your observation or analysis of just how bad things are currently? You need to understand it in context. Before the attack came, Gaza has been under siege for many years. They have a shortage of medical supplies. They have a shortage of fuel. They have a shortage of parts and implements for the hospitals. They have a shortage of fuel. They have you know, a, a continuous economic blockade. They have the COVID-19 cases. They, could, they were battling to get vaccines. Israel blocked that. So they have been in difficulty. There's a massive unemployment. People are, are caught up with debt. They can't pay in the, the expenses. They can't, students can't study. It, and COVID-19 has made it more difficult. So progress has been difficult. So economically, as Gaza has been in a terrible situation. The bombing aggravates a terrible situation. And the first port of call or the first target are residential buildings. By attacking residential buildings, you create a severe type of dependency or requirement for new apartments, new places for people to move in. They have to move away from the northern part of the country. So now there's a need for mass accommodation of people who've lost their homes and big buildings are targeted with 300 apartments or, or more totally destroyed, putting deliberate added, added burden on the people. With that comes the danger of more COVID spread, because now they can't be social distancing. People have to move together. It's about finding new apartments and new places to stay. Uh -huh. While that happens, those killed and those injured then require assistance in hospital. But the hospitals are already in trouble because of COVID-19 and because they don't have enough medical supplies and you know enough uh, medical equipment. Then, of course, there's a blockage, so no fuel can come into the country. So there's not enough fuel to drive the generators of the hospital. The electricity only runs two to four hours a day, which creates a problem for water and sewage. All those are compounded by the fact that more people are going to lose their jobs, more breadwinners are lost, and more people need food. And with the bombing, they can't go out in the streets, only limited times to get food items. So all these things are compounded by the war. And of course, because it's, there's a blockage, it's very difficult to get building material in, to rebuild your lives, to rebuild your buildings. And even from the last wars, the buildings are incomplete. So these are the challenges, accommodation, food, water, medical supplies, medical support, and the spread of COVID-19. Well, take us through how Gift of the Givers is lending a hand in the humanitarian situation in Gaza and uh, how the emergency response needs of the Palestinians injured during the ongoing incidents in East Jerusalem amongst the Israeli Air Force attacks on Gaza Strip are met. Well, fortunately, we have a presence inside Gaza. We've been there for many, many years. 
and we support hospitals, we support clinics. We've got a clinic that we own ourselves, the Kuza Clinic. There's a preschool we support called the Kuza, the Kuza Preschool. We've got a woman and child care center. We've put up in Gaza itself there for many years. It has a counseling facility, it does trauma counseling, it looks after the kids, it has a preschool. And of course, we've been supporting injured people with uh, wheelchairs, prosthesis. We do organ transplantation in the country. We support medical supplies to the hospitals and whenever you even if you can buy it to support them and food parcels for the widows food parcels for the poor debt relief stores then we've got three desalination plants now with that presence on site in in in, in, in gaza it gives us an advantage mm -hmm. first of all after this war there's going to be more than 200,000 right now children who require from our counseling we have a facility to assist with that but i mean that's long term immediately the first day within the first few hours we bought whatever medical stocks available and took it to the hospitals that required the medical support. And we're still doing that on an ongoing basis. Whoever can get stock, we make it available, we buy it, we get it to the hospitals. Who need wheelchairs, you know, or immediate support, we do that. We've already been supplying food to the homes that have been affected. We visited the victims in the hospitals. We have provided them with cash for themselves and for their families and any additional aid. Our desalination plants are providing more water. It's not easy for the trucks to move because the bombing is continuous. But when we can and when it's possible and when we can move, our water plants are, be, are more busy to provide more water for, for more areas. The hospitals, if they have a shortage of money for fuel, when they can get it, we can, we'll, we'll pay for that. So there's a range of things that we're doing right now. We try to find buildings safer from the front lines where we can put people up for accommodation. And if we can't find a building, we already look at available apartments where we will pay the rent for six months or longer for those displaced to stay in those apartments. Now, in particular, the Gaza Strip is one of the most densely populated places on Earth with about uh, you know, 1.7 million people in an area only 10 kilometers wide by 40 kilometers long. And uh, it's said to have a population density twice that of New York City in the United States. So with the violence that's currently raging on, Dr. Suleiman, uh, I would imagine mobility is restricted. I mean, navigating around these massive groups. So just how difficult is it getting food aid and other forms of aid to these people? It's very, very complicated. It's not easy. Sometimes on days people cannot get any food. But the Palestinians are adept at finding ways. They look, they're not, they're not a, a scared nation. They're a very brave nation, and they will do anything to help each other. They will risk their lives. They will move around. They'll do the, you'll see them do the funerals while the bombing is taking place. They're not afraid to do that. You know, they will carry people from the injured places while the bombs are falling and take them to hospital. It's been years, and you know, they found a way around it. And it, to them, it doesn't matter if their lives are lost in the, in the process of saving somebody else's life. Now you hear of a blood shortage. You will soon see thousands of them will turn up to provide blood, to give blood donations for people they don't even know. You know? So if they will get the food supplies. And even they, over the years, the shopkeepers are, are very adept at finding ways of delivering food parcels to, to an address that you give them. Of course, most of the addresses are fluted now with the bombing taking place in certain parts of the country. But it's a process, it requires patience, it's, it's, it's sometimes very difficult, but people, like yesterday, we lost com continue, complete uh, communication with them. They said there was no electricity, there was bombing. We couldn't send the images, we couldn't talk to you, we couldn't get through you. A motorcycle can't move, a motorcycle is struck, the ambulance are hit, cars are hit. So when there's a little lull, there's an opportunity. In those few minutes, it's used very effectively to deliver what needs to be delivered. You know, the flare-up could get worse, uh, Dr. Suleiman. I mean, if Israel decides to launch a ground offensive into the Gaza Strip, and I'm told that Israeli officials are still reportedly considering this option with tanks and uh, heavy artillery close to the territory's northern perimeter and already involved in the fighting, just uh, how prepared are humanitarian organizations like yours for the escalation of violence and the subsequent increase in casualties? It's not like we haven't been there before. You know, it's, it's from 2009 war we were there. The only difference now is that we're not sending teams. In the 2009 war, we had teams there. In 2014, we had teams there. But because of the COVID cases there, the border locked down. And of course, more importantly, our teams are required in South Africa as we're entering the third wave. So it's ir irrational for us to take our teams across when we need them in our own country. So this time, it's remote support. You know, for whatever we can do, any international disaster is remote support. Yes, the artillery will cause more, the incursion into Gaza will cause more deaths. It's not something new. It's not something we haven't seen before. In, in, in 2009, there thousands of them died, and even in 2014, thousands died and thousands more were injured. And the hospitals were, and doctors were affected. And right now, they even bombed hospitals. It's, it's, a, it's a characteristic of Israeli army 
to attack hospitals, civilian sites, ambulances, doctors, mosques. You know, it's something not new. It's done for years. And already a few hospitals have been destroyed. The Indonesian hospital, which I saw personally myself when I was there in 2014, another two hospitals have been hit. So and, and probably many more hospitals and ambulances will be hit in the next coming days. So yes, we, when the troops come in, there's going to be more casualties, more people are going to die, more people are going to be injured. It just means providing more supplies. The only, the, well, the biggest challenge is to get those supplies. Because of the blockade and difficulty in accessing goods, you have to buy whatever's available in the country. And by some miracle, if some businessman is sharp enough and gets a stop in, you can get it, or if Egypt opens its borders, or you know, you can get supplies from there. But at, at, at some point, accessing supplies becomes very, very difficult. I mean, the health system is strained already, and uh, as we've mentioned, uh, as a result of the COVID-19 and the Israeli authorities that closed the areas crossing in the north of the Gaza Strip, should we brace ourselves for a further degeneration of the humanitarian situation there? Yes. I mean, with each day, remember, less fuel, more bombs, more wounded, less supplies, more health facilities affected, less water available, less electricity available. That only compounds the problem. You can't take wounded people out of the country for, so for care like they used to do normally. But I think if Egypt opens borders, they'll be able to take some people out that way. But normally they used to take to the Arab crossings, fly them to Turkey for care and, you know, get, get supplies. But all this is not going to happen this time. You know, it, it, it's very unlikely that it's going to happen. And many, many people are going to die simply, not only because of the bombing, but because of, not from, die directly from the bombing, but die indirectly because they've been injured, they could be saved, but because they don't have the supplies, they will die because of that. Under normal circumstances, they could be saved, but they won't. All right, Dr. Suleiman, great chatting to you. Thank you so much for your time. That was a gift of the Givers founder, Dr. Imtia Suleiman, joining us live via Zoom.